Jesus teaches his, teaches his followers about his absence. I'm going to um, share mostly out of John 14. But we're going to glance into John 10 a little bit. Now, John is the only, Fred, are you paying attention? John is the only non-synoptic gospel. Okay, so John's gospel is distinctly unique compared to the other three. And John does, uh, in, in his, his dialogue to the reader, he's wanting to introduce you to God among us. So in John 10, we're going to jump right away into Scripture. There we go. Whoops. Yeah, that red might be a little bit hard, so you'll have to trust me. Starting at verse 23, Jesus was walking in the temple complex in Solomon's colonnade. And the Jews surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Look at what Jesus responds. I did tell you, and you don't believe. Jesus answered him, The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But if you don't believe because you are not my sheep, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give eternal life, and they will never perish, ever. No one will snatch them out of my hands. My Father has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Again, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. All right, suspense. Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. Which of these works are you stoning me for? Now, is that not a, a, like an amazing question for Jesus to ask? We aren't stoning you for good work, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, Make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Isn't it written in Scripture, I said you are God's, lo G, lowercase g. If he called those whom the word of God came to God's, and Scripture cannot be broken, do you say you are blaspheming to the one the Father has set apart? and sent into the world because I'm, I said I am the Son of God. If I am not doing my Father's works, don't believe me. But if I'm doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Then they were trying to again seize him. Yet he eluded the grasp. Now I can imagine in a crowd full of people and you got a mob kind of stew, stewing up that you want to grab hold of somebody and Jesus kind of just tucks away himself in the crowd and disappears. Maybe puts his hood up and just walks a while with the crowd. But Let's talk about Jesus' ministry. What did Jesus do when he was with us for those three plus years? He taught, he healed. What, what kind of teachings and healings did he do? Miraculous. Miracles. Signs and wonders. 
Would that make you a believer? He's, he's like, which of the works do you have issue with? I mean, depending on, on how you read Scripture, the minimum count of miracles that Jesus did is about 40. But there's ways to count certain things and get to a number in the 50s. And then there's times where it says Jesus entered the town and healed some. We count that as one because we don't know how many some is. So some of those occasions where there's 40 miracles, he healed multiple people at that location and we're counting that once. But here in our passage in John 10, Jesus is a controversial figure. And when I say controversial, I'm talking about people want to take him out and stone him controversial. Yes, this is a level of controversy above what we feel about Trump. You know, this is a level contra of, of, of controversy greater than any of our historical characters that we now know of. You know, there's, there's a few people that we want to kill in history, like Adolf Hitler, but, there, but that doesn't bring us the controversy that Jesus had where people were going to stone him, and yet he healed people on the Sabbath, and that upset the Pharisees. Because to do any healing is work. And you can't work on the Sabbath. So, so showing mercy on the Sabbath in their eyes was work. Jesus is like, not work for me. It may be work for you if you're a nurse. But it ain't work for me. John 14. We're going to be here the whole chapter. So if you got your scriptures, uh, if you got your passage, here we are. Your heart must not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. I showed the Greek word up there in blue, matsio. That's the Greek word. If I would not, I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Now, I want to talk about that Greek word, mansio, for a moment. In the original Greek, that word is kind of a complicated word. Depending on the translation that you read, that word could be translated to rooms. I've gone home. I've gone, I'm going to prepare a room for you. But mansio is also the root word for mansion, and most mansions are found on an estate. So the word has grandeur attached to it. <clears throat> the context of the Greek in this is this is a place that we are going to dwell at. It's a big place. It's, it's not a Motel 6 big place. But there are images that if you read it in some translations, you don't get the grandeur in it. You get the simplicity. I've gone to, home to prepare a room for you. In my father's house, there are many rooms. That makes it sound more like a Motel 6. But the Greek word is mansio, which is mansion is also the root out of that. And so he's, he's going home to prepare a place for us. There's nothing wrong in the interpretation of a grand location for us that Jesus is preparing for us. I want you to clearly hear that. It is not a Motel 6. And I want you to feel comforted that it's not a Motel 6. Okay. Verse 7, if you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Lord, Philip asked, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. Jesus answered, or said to him, have I been among you all this time 
without you knowing me, Philip? He, I think he's annoyed by the question. The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you do not speak on my own. My Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because the word of the works themselves. So basically he's telling John, or not John, John is recording that Jesus is telling Philip, look, do you not see the evidence around you? This is a joint adventure. The Father and I are one. I don't do anything apart from him. I don't teach you anything apart from him. The works that I see are not mine alone. They are in my Father. I'm doing my Father's business. He is confirming that, that if you see Jesus, you see the Father. He is confirming, I am the way. I assure you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And he will do even greater works than these because I am doing, going to the Father. Whoever asks in my name, I will do that, the Father. Do that so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Now, I need to pause there because there is a group of people that I call the prosperity message people that take the context of verse 13 and 14 out. And they take 13 and 14 to mean they can claim financial blessings in their life by praying for financial blessings, and God will do that if they ask for it in Jesus' name. But the context of chapter 14 is not that. The context of chapter 14 is about doing the works of the Father. Now, if you look at verse 12, Jesus tells us, you will do what I do. I know a ton of Christians that dare not believe that they can do anything that Jesus did. Not only do they not believe it, they won't even try it. But yet, many of them will read verses 13 and 14 and say, I can pray for a Cadillac and get it. Because Jesus said so. The same context. They won't even try to heal somebody by laying on hands, as Scripture tells them, or show compassion to those who are in need. They won't even try it. But they'll claim a Cadillac in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, you're all thin ice with me, philosophy-wise, theology-wise. They don't line up. If you believe that you can claim a Cadillac and claim financial blessings, then you should be healing the sick. Because they're the same paragraph. It's in context. If you believe God's word is true, then we have the power to heal people through the Holy Spirit. Not power of our own, but power through what God has given us. And if you think you have the power to claim financial blessings, you better claim all of it. Not just that. Because the context is this is about my father's work. The context is, <clears throat> this is about my father's work. You know, so we have to understand we are our biggest enemies when we, when we decide that we are not going to trust Scripture in certain places where it says, pray for. If we don't trust God to pray for these things, we're going to get what we pray for, which is little. Okay, but we have to have the right heart. We have to have the right context to the scripture. And again, we are here looking where Jesus says, you can do these things. Right? Now, Paul was a great apostle. Would you not agree with me? Paul healed the sick. Yet, Paul had something he called a thorn in his side. And he repeatedly asked God to heal him from the thorn in his side. And it would not heal. And God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Right? 
So the God doesn't heal everybody, including the Apostle Paul, who healed many through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have to wrap our head around this. It takes a little bit of courage, all right? How many of you think it takes courage to be a Christian today? All right. If you're a farmer, it takes courage to be a farmer. It might even, Fred, I'm going to pick on you a little bit because I know I, 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 your, your first row, I'm going to pick, you might have to be like insane to try to be a farmer, you know, just because <coughs> it's such a complicated industry and it has so many variables that any one of them could bankrupt you for a year. Okay, so I'm going to talk about faith for a moment here in this passage because we are looking at this place here where I want to motivate you to acts of courage. All right? There are people in this world that are waiting for the Christians to rise up with a voice of courage. And when I say that, I'm not saying that we need to preach damnation to a culture, though there may be reason to do so. I'm saying that when you are in a restaurant and you bow your head to say grace, that you know that you're going to say grace. Now, I meet with a group of guys most Fridays for lunch, and we just have a group of fellowship, and we just, we just gather together. Well, here's what they know. Somebody's going to say grace. Not everyone in that group is a believer, but we're going to say grace. And we have, in the past, gone into a place. It doesn't matter. I'll call it Sam's Club because we go to Sam's Club or wherever, and one of us says grace. Lord of Jesus, bless our conversation. Bless this food, Lord God. Bless this time of fellowship. We are just so thankful that we are able to do this. And Lord, we just want you to be with us this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We've had mothers come up with little kids, say, thank you for that. Now my kids know that we are not the only ones. There's a group of people waiting for us just to be obedient, good people. To say grace in a public place and not feel pressure to keep our voices down. Because we are going to joke, we're going to laugh, we're going to do all kinds of things. People are going to know we've been there. And if you know me, I kind of am memorable wherever I go. People are like, better get a three meet out there, here he comes. They see me come in the door, put a fresh one in. I'm, I'm not kidding you, they know me. Matter of fact, I went in there the other day. I picked up a pepperoni pizza, and they looked at me and said, what's up? I said, this is for the wife. Oh, okay, we get it. Because I didn't get my normal thing. I didn't get a three me. So they do know me. I want you to, to know there is risk when you step out of your comfort zone. But it's worth the risk. Now, I'm, I'm going to be candid here. Um, how many of you, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at a crowd that's mostly married, how many of you were nervous when you started dating? So my newlyweds back here, they, they, they put their hand up. That's good. Because there's, there's fear that is tied to the risk. Now, I got newlyweds, so it apparently turned out to be worth the risk. Right? And then how long have you guys been married?
Okay, so in March you'll be. So um, I'm not going to ask Ricky. I'm Fred. Is was it worth the risk? <laughs> okay. My son, do not date for, I mean, he, he fell in love with a girl that he met through a ministry opportunity. Um, he never asked her out. It was a setup. Some of the friends who knew my son was too scared to ask this girl out, they got together and said, let's go on this joint adventure to the North Union of Theodore Roosevelt Park, and we'll make Mike drive us. And so the friends all agreed to do this. And one by one, all of them disappeared till he was left with this girl that he liked. And that was, quote, unquote, the first date. And he never asked her out. And they started dating again, because my son is a scaredy cat. He was so scared of rejection and fear, he never would ask a girl out. I figured that when he got married, she would have to ask him, because he just wouldn't get up the courage, you know. We have Christians today that live in fear of rejection. That's why they don't share their faith. They live in fear of uh, persecution so that they don't make their voices heard. And, and I'm here to tell you, Jesus was a controversial person. He couldn't go anywhere without somebody picking up a stone and wanting to stone him. So don't be afraid of controversy. And don't be afraid to pray in public. Don't be afraid to introduce yourself by a person of faith. On verse 15 of chapter 14, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it does not see him or know him, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you an orphan. I am coming to you. This is the promise that Christians are not alone even when you think you're alone. This is the confidence that we have. Is Now, I, I've told you guys this. I was the only Christian in my school. That was a lonely place and a lonely time. I wasn't a very good Christian in school, but I was the only born-again believer professing to have an active relationship with Jesus. And I needed something, which it was the Holy Spirit. And a little while... The world will see me no longer, but you will see me because I live, you will live too. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will love, will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Now, this is where I'm going to make a plug. You know, we, we are spending a, a significant amount of time as we're going through Jeremiah in Sunday school. This is the answer that we talked about today. This is the heart issue of our culture. If this can be worked out in a living environment in the church, we will make a positive impact with our world around us. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and he will come come to him and make our home with him. 
The one who does not love me will not keep my words. And the word that, that you hear is not mine, but is not but is from the Father who sent me. As we wind through this passage, Jesus is making a strong effort for the followers to understand that his time with us is short. But that is not going to mean you will be ill-prepared for when I'm not around. You will be well-prepared for when I'm not around. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of see how the apostles, who are now just disciples, who are a collection of mostly uneducated people, could feel this way, that they were unprepared. Because most of them probably can't quote to you Isaiah. Most of them probably cannot quote to you terribly many of the laws of Moses, the 613. You know, they might be able to name off the Big Ten, and they might be able to quote a handful of Old Testament passages, but most of them probably are not quoters of Scripture. We close out this last of the message today. I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you. But the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give you to you as the world gives. <clears throat> Your heart must not be troubled or tearful, fearful. You have heard me tell you I'm going away. I'm coming to you. If you love me, you will, would have received what I am going to that I would re rejoice that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. Now have told you, I have told you now before I, it appears so that when it does happen, you may believe. I will not talk with you much longer because the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. On the contrary, I'm going away so that the world may know that I love the Father just as the Father commanded me, and so I do. Get up. Let's leave this place. Jesus is preparing his disciples to be without him. He has told them about the counselor. He's told them about the controversy, the the, the persecution coming. He has prepared them for hardships. And he's, he's telling them, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. If you love me, you do as I've asked. That's the simple end of the game. If you love me, you do as I ask. So as you leave here, not today, I want you to think in bigger pictures for 2022. I want you to pray in your prayer life about God giving you a task for 2022. Something doable that you can reach out and try to do. And I also want you to put something on your list to learn in 2022. Something that you want to be taught, whether it be by me or by the Holy Spirit, that, so that you can grow in 2022. Because we, we are in this period in January, we want to step out of our comfort zone we have a sense of urgency that things are in our culture are building up to something. Let us be vessels that we are prepared for what God is going to do in us so that we may reach others. Let's stand. And if you wish to close out without a closing song, we can do that.